Breaking news today on Seculo as a huge election win for President Trump. The ACLJ was engaged on behalf of seven states. Keeping you informed and engaged now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo. We have another a victory to report in these cases, uh, trying to utilize the 14th Amendment to remove President Trump in his re-election efforts from the ballot, the primary ballot and the general election ballot. So if you did even write him in, your vote would not be counted. Uh, this latest win comes out of Michigan. We filed a major amicus brief. We represented Republican parties of seven states, the Michigan Republican Party, the Oklahoma Republican Party, the Colorado Republican Party, the West Virginia Republican Party, Kansas Republican Party, North Dakota's Republican Party, and Delaware's Republican Party. In Oklahoma, we've already gotten a win. That is also the case in Minnesota. We have attorneys making their closing arguments today in Colorado. We are still active right now in West Virginia, and we are in the intervention process in the Commonwealth of Virginia, fighting back to ensure that your right to vote for the candidate of your choice in the primary and general election. And Dad, what we're seeing across the country uh, is a lot of victories, but it would only take one of these court cases. We're watching that one in Colorado one very of, closely. Yeah. Uh, to move it to the next level. Well, I think, look, the Colorado case, I, I our team did a great job, let me say that, uh, led by Jane Raskin. Uh, but I will say this also, that judge seemed uh, pretty predetermined on where this was going to go, and she was going to rule in favor of the Secretary of State having the authority to remove the former president from the ballot. This sets a terrible electoral precedent. We would then take it to the Colorado Court of Appeals and ultimately to the Colorado Supreme Court. I actually think the Colorado case is the case that will end up at the U.S. Supreme Court. I think this is the, there will be one case that ends up at the U.S. Supreme Court, and it will likely be the case where our side loses. If we win, I think the court's less likely to take it. If we lose, and that the and a court decision stands that says, in essence, that a elected official or appointed official in some state, uh, the Board of Elections or the supervisors or the Secretary of State, can remove a duly authorized presidential candidate on their own accord would be a horrible precedent. I think we'd have an overwhelming victory at the Supreme Court. So I think Colorado, keep your eye on that one. That's the one I think is going to the Supreme Court. You don't think it necessarily takes like a split because I do not. Because in Colorado, if they did it there, it would affect every other state's voting for, if you were voting for Donald Trump in a different state, it would affect your vote because your vote would be watered down. That's exactly right. It's a dilution of vote for the other states. And that's why that when we're representing multiple states, as you said, uh, in the brief in the case in Michigan, where we're representing the Michigan uh, Republican Party, Oklahoma, Colorado, West Virginia, Kansas, North Dakota, Delaware. That's very important because we're sending a, a more of a national s- signal that this issue is significant. It's significant for the country. It's probably the most important election integrity case in the United States right now. And the ACLJ front and center on that. And we will continue to work. We've got a jam-packed show. We're going to be joined by... Uh, by the way, uh, former Israeli ambassador in the United States and current member of the Knesset and chairman of the World Likud, Danny Danone, will be calling into the broadcast today to give an update on what's happening there. At the same time, we've got a lot of activity going on. Rick Grinnell is going to join us later. We'll be taking your calls at 800 684 We'll have more on this huge win uh, in Michigan, but also we're going to have more, of course, on the situation in Israel. Folks, your support of the ACLJ has been critical. I, I need to give you this number. We started our campaign for our champions with 15,608. I will tell you that five weeks later, six weeks later, we're now at 17,190. So we have had a 1,500 increase, and and that's great. Because some people, you know, fall off after a couple of years of doing. We understand that. So if you go to ACLJ.org, we're in our Faith and Freedom Drive. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift for. And if you can make that a monthly gift, you know what happens? That becomes... You become an ACLJ champion, and that helps us set our budget. It does, and it means that when you've got a breakout of war, like in Israel, and you've got clients to represent, to bring to Washington, D.C., to meet with members of Congress, you're able to do it. We don't have to think about, again, uh, whether or not we've got the budget to do it. If we have to go overseas for those clients, we can as well. We can add additional clients, maybe up to 120. Because of your financial support to the ACLJ, become one of those recurring donors at ACLJ.org and double your impact this month. 
What does it mean to be an ACLJ champion? Becoming an ACLJ champion means joining us in the fight for liberty, in the fight for law, in the fight for peace, in the fight for freedom. The battles being fought in courtrooms right now will decide what kind of future our kids will have tomorrow. So when you join as an ACLJ champion, we now actually have a baseline to know what we can possibly accomplish. And it, look, the dream is, is vast. Being a champion means that you get to come alongside churches who are being zoned out of properties, who are being forced to obtain liquor licenses simply to operate, coming alongside students who are being told they can't read their Bible in school or even bring it. Becoming an ACLJ champion allows us to take on more cases internationally in places where Christian persecution is happening on a daily basis. The need for the defense of these Christians is overwhelming, and we can't do it without you. Becoming an ACLJ champion means getting into a fight with deep state elites who are attacking our school children, who are attacking pro-life Christians. We have lawyers right now winning in courtrooms across the world, but none of it would matter without the ACLJ champions. Simply put, we don't win unless ACLJ champions continue to step up. We can't do what we do without you. By becoming a monthly donor, you can become a champion of life. A champion of liberty, a champion of freedom. Please join us. Please join us. Please join us. Become an ACLJ champion today. Secular, we are to your phone calls to 1 800 684 3110. That's 1 800 684 3110. So you've seen wins in Oklahoma, you've seen wins in Minnesota. We have now won in Michigan, uh, where we represented not just the Michigan Republican Party, uh, but Oklahoma, Colorado, West Virginia, Kansas, North Dakota, and Delaware's uh, Republican parties. And in that case, uh, the judge, very clear, the Michigan court. Of claims judge uh, James Redford said in his decision Tuesday that questions about Trump's role in the January 6th insurrection and whether it's constitutionally bars him from returning to the White House should be addressed by elected representatives in Congress. It's a political question that should not be decided yeah. by the judicial branch. So we should not have judges decide picking and choosing who gets to be on the ballot. That, that's exactly the right case. And of course, no actions on insurrection as insurrection has been raised. There's been no charges on the Insurrection Act. There's been no allegations on that. So that's very, very interesting. Harry Hutchinson, our director of policy, uh, law professor, has also reviewed the opinion. Uh, Professor Hutchinson, your view of what we have here. Two conclusions surface from the Michigan Court of Claims decision denying declaratory relief uh, in this particular case. Uh, first, uh, the argument for Trump's disqualification is not yet ripe uh, at this particular period of time. Why? Because of the existence of several distinct contingencies. Uh, and so here the Michigan Court of Claims relies on the Minnesota uh, decision. Second, uh, as uh, Jordan points out, the court relies on the political question doctrine uh, to bar declaratory relief sought by the plaintiffs. And here the Michigan court relies on the New Hampshire case. So you want to avoid political chaos. And uh, I would argue that uh, President Trump's uh, op political opponents, they love chaos. But if we focus initially on the ripeness argument, uh, the court offers five distinct uh, counter arguments uh, for purposes of denying relief. First, it's up to the political parties Which of course to, it is. Right. to decide the Who nominee the for right. uh, president. Um, and so whether or not Trump is selected as the Republican Party nominee is highly contingent, the court uh, uh, suggests, on outside factors. Uh, how strong are his opponents, for instance? Uh, third, whether or not a candidate is placed on a presidential primary ballot does not mean that the candidate is necessarily eligible for office. 
So in some respects, the court is deferring the decision with respect to the general election. Mm -hmm. And then fourth, uh, if Donald Trump is indeed selected as the nominee, he must still win what? The general election. That's a, a contingency. And fifth, even if Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies, and I think the judge doubts that, Congress still has the potential role of intervening to remove any disqualification. Right. So at the end of the day, this particular case is not yet ripe. And in addition to that, we still have the political question doctrine. So I think uh, it's, it's huge here. I mean, the idea that a, 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 a a judge or a secretary of state could make this call is outrageous. Now, I think we're going to get the contrary conclusion, though, Harry, in, in Colorado. I think that is probably correct. Say, we're trying it right now. And, it's our team's and I it, would also tough. keep my eye on Michigan uh, because uh, as the um, uh, general election looms, yeah. uh, it would not surprise me if the Secretary of State actually does, in fact, intervene on behalf of these particular uh, plaintiffs mm. uh, to remove uh, Donald Trump from office you know, it's and then narrow the window for an appeal of that particular decision. Here's what I think is going to happen, Jordan. And the, I think the Colorado case is going to move very quickly because if the judge rules that he does not appear on the col- that they, they could remove him from the primary ballot when's the colorado primary i think it's march yeah so you've got to start printing those ballots by so, the beginning of the year at least so that means you got to have a final adjudication be- by before you know a couple of weeks before yep. at least oh at least so i think it's conceivable that we have a case that's bouncing around the supreme court in january uh in colorado i think it's gonna move that quickly yeah i mean there's 28 of these actions across the country right now most of them are being dismissed pretty quickly uh, but this one in Colorado is moving forward uh, very rapidly to conclusion at the district court level. I mean, this is the one we're going to see, uh, the first decision uh, from a judge after a full trial. I mean, we saw, again, two have been dismissed, Michigan, uh, actually four have been dismissed, New Hampshire, Michigan, Minnesota, and Florida. Uh, there's been voluntary dismissals by the plaintiffs in Maine, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Utah, and Idaho, but still pending Alaska, Montana, Nevada, Arizona. Colorado, where we're in, New Mexico, Texas, Kansas, Wisconsin, South Carolina, of course, Virginia we've talked about, West Virginia we're involved in, New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Delaware. So, I mean, there's still a lot of states at play here that have to come to a conclusion very soon so that the the ballots for the primary are printed correctly. Yeah, so it's interesting. We've got a comment that came in on YouTube. It's a really poignant question, that is this. I'm concerned that the Supreme Court won't take up the case letting the states decide. So here's the question. I mean, it's, it's a very good question. I think they have to take, if well, if if Trump wins and the Republican Party wins, that they put, put up whoever they want that meets the otherwise qualifications, I don't think the Supreme Court has to engage it because there, there's no harm at that point. But if, let's say, Colorado goes against us, which, I, again, is my thought that it probably does, I think, Harry, they have to take it because if not, it's going to affect that one state could have impact for the entire other 49 states. Absolutely. And that is particularly true with respect to the primary process, because even if we're talking about a blue state jurisdiction, which is, let's say, more likely to select Biden in a general election, uh, Trump has been affected and the right of the voters in those blue states have been affected in helping to select the nominee, for instance, for the Republican Party. So I believe the Supreme Court would need to intervene to the extent that any local jurisdiction, that is the state yeah. jurisdiction, uh, rules against uh, Donald Trump's this candidacy. Is, this is interesting with Colorado. So the primary is March 5th is the 2024 Colorado uh, presidential primary. But the military ballots have to be printed in early December in Colorado. So this thing really is on a short fuse. I mean, I think we're at the Supreme Court on that case in a matter of weeks, not months. I really do. I think that judge is going to rule by early December, and it will go to the Colorado Court of Appeals, and they may sit on it. We may move for an expedited. They may do nothing. Then we may have to take it up on an emergency basis to the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that is the case to keep your eye on right now. I mean, Michigan, too but is going to be Colorado because I think I'm expecting an adverse decision there. But 
overall we're getting great decisions, but one state yeah. could impact the election significantly. Yeah, I mean, uh, significantly. I mean, yeah, really. Uh, yes, and so that's why, again, this has to be ultimately decided. You can't have one state that's going to say, in this state, uh, Donald Trump's not going to be counted, but in the other 49 states he is, because then he's automatically down a state, even in uh, a situation where uh, he might uh, have won that state. That might be a state he could win. Uh, it's interesting. We just got this from the Colorado judge because we're in court right now in the, in the hearing. The Colorado judge said she wanted it decided before Thanksgiving. So it should be decided next week, if not yeah. by the end of this week. Well, it makes sense. If the ballots have to be printed early December right. yeah. um, for the military, I think, look, folks, so th- what does this mean? This means that in the middle of handling all of the issues we're handling at the United Nations and at the international courts on the Israel and, and negotiating for the hostage release, we've got a Supreme Court case that is is simmering right now on low simmer, about to go to uh, medium simmer. And probably by th- end of Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving, a full simmer. What does this mean? The ACLJ has to be fully engaged. How do you help? We are in the biggest two months of our year, November and December. And we've had a great result so far. And we need your help. And this is how we do it. We have a faith and freedom drive that is going on right now. We are handling issues across the country and around the globe. While we fight for the to free the Israeli hostages, and we I've got listen, we were on that already this morning. Uh, CC Hall and I were on an early morning Zoom call with lawyers from all over the the world that are working on this and the team we put together for this. We're also continuing to fight for your voting rights because that's what's at stake here. We had the Fourteenth Amendment win last night. We had that massive win in Michigan, as we talked about. I'm concerned about the case. That's going on in Colorado, so I think that's going to be the Supreme Court case. And we're in Colorado today fighting that out, by the way. This past week, we took action at the U.N. to free hostages, representing four families. I'm being told by our team in Israel that by Sunday, that's probably going to be another 30 or 40. They're meeting with them in groups. What does this mean? In order to meet these demands, we've launched our Faith and Freedom Drive. With Your tax-deductible gifts will be double dollar for dollar through the ACLJ's Faith and Fa- Freedom Drive. So we encourage you to go to aclj.org uh, to donate today. You can also become, and this is really important, folks. I want to talk to you about this. If you become an ACLJ champion, you are affecting our budget for the in next entire year. So we want you to be a champion of life, liberty, and freedom. So when you make that monthly gift that's matched, you go and say, I, if you can do it monthly, you become an ACLJ champion. And we've added 1,500 new champions in just little less than six weeks aclj.org for that and just hit that monthly recur- recurring and you become an aclj yeah, champion that recurring uh, donation so important to become an aclj champion and your gifts will still be doubled this month go to aclj.org donate today we'll be right back with member of knesset danny a massive pro-israel rally was held in washington dc the images coming in from the national mall tonight tens of thousands of people taking part in the March for Israel, a show of solidarity and support for Israel and for the Israeli people following the October 7th Hamas terror attack. In the shadow of the U.S. Capitol, a dramatic show of solidarity, the largest pro-Israel demonstration in the U.S. since the war began. The amount of anti-Semitism in America is something that in my life I never, ever thought I would see. What an honor and a blessing to stand with you in solidarity during this very difficult moment for the Jewish people and for Israel. Hamas brutally attacked Israel on October 7th because Hamas wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. So let me be clear, we will never let that happen. Thank you to the hundreds of thousands who've gathered from all over the United States, all people of goodwill, friends from different communities, faiths, and denominations who've gathered today for this massive show of solidarity. As Prime Minister Netanyahu says so well, This is a fight between good and evil, between light and darkness, between civilization and barbarism. The calls for a ceasefire are outrageous. Israel, we in America have your back. America feels your pain. We ache with you. We stand with you. And we will not rest until you get all the assistance you need. Welcome back 
back to Secchio. We are joined by a very special guest, uh, former ambassador uh, to the United States and to the United Nations, Danny Danone. He currently serves as a member of the Knesset. He also is the chairman of World Likud. Uh, he is a, and has, again, served as Israel's 17th permanent representative to the United Nations. So un- understands what goes on domestically inside Israel, but also how Israel is treated around the world internationally. Ambassador, it's great to have you. Danny, always good to talk with you. I, I wanted to start with this. Um, I want to get your assessment on where things are as you see it right now. Um, I know that there's an operation going on at the hospital in Gaza, uh, strategic and precise. What's your sense of where things are right now? Yeah, thank you, Jerry and Jordan, for having me, and thank you for standing with Israel. Uh, we are in the middle of the war. We are fighting in Gaza. We're dealing with a, a very vicious and evil uh, enemy. They are hiding behind the hospitals, behind civilians, and we are moving. We are moving slowly, though, because we want to minimize the casualties to our forces and to civilians, and they are trying to maximize. They know that we will win. They, they know that we will defeat them, but they are trying to, to make sure that we will pay a price, and we are trying to make sure we are not paying a heavy price. Uh, but we expect the international community, including the U.S., to stand with us and not to push us for ceasefires. I don't get it. Why we need to cease fire after what happened to us? The U.S. never spoke about a ceasefire when you attacked uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So we are continuing with the war, and we are moving slowly, but we are determined to finish the job this time. Danny, I know there's a lot of needs going on right now. One of them is financial, and we're, we're, our government affairs office is working on that um, on Capitol Hill right now. Uh, militarily, I mean, it sounds like Israel stretched pretty pretty thin right now, and I know that assistance, uh, global assistance, is critical. Indeed, you know, we're also fighting in the north with Hezbollah. Uh, the Houthis in Yemen are sending rockets to our southern border, so we we feel under attack. But at the same time, we are strong. We know that we have the support of our allies, uh, and I actually want to thank you, Jay, for organizing missions coming to Israel now. That's what we need. We need people to support us, to stand with us, to pray for us, uh, and we will prevail at the end. But, uh, you know, it's really hard because it's not a war that you fight a real army. I sit in many committees uh, in the Knesset, the Foreign Affairs and Defense, and, you know, I know the details. It's very complicated when you fight a terrorist organization who is hiding behind civilians. It's much easier to fight a, a army, a military. It's sophisticated, complicated, but we have no choice, so we have to, to do what we have to do. You know, Ambassador Danone, uh, the, the footage put out by the IDF kind of put to rest in much of the media, even though they don't love to accept it, how Hamas was operating underneath hospitals throughout Gaza. And you saw weapons left over, um, uh, lots of equipment left over, and people saw those images. And, of course, the world that doesn't want to accept it says, oh, that was just Israel putting that up as propaganda. But... People, uh, you know, thinking people realize that what the IDF has been saying and Israel's been saying is true, is that these hospitals, this is how disgusting Hamas operates. They put their bases, they put their weaponry underneath active hospitals uh, to make it that much more difficult for Israel and the soldiers who go in there uh, to, uh, to, uh, again, to attack those Hamas operatives who are hiding behind sick people. It's more than that, Jordan. It's not only that they build the headquarters beneath the hospitals. We know for a fact that those terrorists who came into our communities, butchered innocent families, raped innocent women, and kidnapped 240 Israelis, when they came back to Gaza, they went to those hospitals. We know that. And, And they took hostages into the hospitals. So that's why we are now, we are operating in the hospitals. Uh, it's uh, challenging, but uh, we completed the operation in the, in the Shifa hospital, and we will continue to do whatever is necessary to make sure we bring back all the hostages that were kidnapped by Hamas. I mean, Danny, we, as you know, we're representing a number of the families. We had them here in the United States. We had them on Capitol Hill. We had meetings with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. I mean, we, we, we've been hosting the families. We're, I'm heading over to Brussels uh, to work it with the EU uh, but you, you you mentioned the fact that support in Israel, delegations in Israel right now, you think is the next step of importance, correct? 
people. Absolutely. So last week I, I hosted the Prime Minister Johnson, Boris Johnson from the UK, and the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison from Australia. And it's important, first of all, for the people of Israel, when they see that people are, are here standing with them, support us when we are fighting. And also when people go back home, they tell the story. <clears throat> they meet the families of the hostages. They meet the, the victim's family. I think it's very important for dignitaries uh, to come and stand with us uh, at this crucial moment. Let me ask you this also. Uh, this war is, unlike the Six-Day War, is going to take time. Uh, but Hamas has to be rooted out once and for all and eliminated as a threat to Israel. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, in 2014... Uh, you know, I know you for uh, many years, uh, Jay, you and Jordan and your beautiful family. 2014, I was Deputy Minister of Defense. And I had an argument with the Prime Minister uh, about a ceasefire that Secretary Kerry forced Israel to sign. I told him, don't do it. It will be uh, hectic in the future. We, are, we have to fight now and eliminate Hamas. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the pressure from the U.S. was so strong, uh, and we didn't do what we had to do in 2014. And today we are facing a stronger enemy. Uh, we, we see the numbers of victims we had to pay. But today Israel is left and right, uh, all united, that we have no choice. It's either us or them. Very good. Ambassador Danny, no, uh, Danny, thanks for being with us. Ambassador, thank you for all the work you're doing. We look forward to seeing you. And you know you have our full support, and we will continue to do everything we can to support Israel and the hostages. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think what Ambassador Danone hit on that, too, was uh, the need. It's not so much what's going on in Gaza, but the potential for other fronts to open up in this war. Yeah. And so many of the resources are focusing in on the Gaza Strip, and, and they've been go doing a good job. Uh, but, again, it's meticulous. It yeah. is slow moving. But then if, if Hezbollah does jump in, uh, you've got a very different situation. And they've got GPS rocket, you know, powered rockets that can uh, – We've been there for that. Yes, they it's can very difficult. carry out much more – uh, aggressive action throughout the nation of Israel, long-range uh, rockets as yep. well. And they've also got enemies uh, right to the east, uh, with right on the border with Syria. Let me say this also. We, we are looking at now, with our hostage situation, going to Brussels to deal with that at the European Union there and the European Parliament and the Council of Europe. We're looking at Strasbourg and Paris as also as part of this delegation going over in early December. Um, we're putting together – the ICC stuff, Jordan, is starting uh, – Governments are starting to, especially the ones that lean towards Hamas, are starting to make the rumblings at the ICC. We were very successful in 2008 and 2009 by putting together an international symposium for lawyers. Um, we worked with the Israeli Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of lawyers to handle these cases globally. We are going to do the preliminary work on that, possibly in Strasbourg, as, as early as mid-December or even earlier. This is the kind of work that's going on. While we have all this going on over here, and our government affairs office in, in the United States is working with our team at the ECLJ, folks. None of this happens without you. None of this. Not this broadcast, not our ability to engage on this, not our ability to have the ambassador uh, to the United States, uh, to the U.N. from Israel on our broadcast. Without your support, it doesn't happen. Our Faith and Freedom Drive is halfway through the first month. We're doing great. We need you to continue to support us. Go to aclj.org slash faith and freedom. Any amount you donate is going to be matched. But also, if you can become a champion, folks, and make that monthly gift, it makes all the difference in the world. We're at a moment in history we prayed we would never see again. We're experiencing global attacks on our faith and our freedom that we haven't seen in generations. What we are witnessing in Israel could be the precursor to a second Holocaust. This was a full-scale land, sea, and air invasion. Policies have consequences, and look in the world we're in. Russia's fighting with Ukraine. China about to invade Taiwan. The Middle East imploding. Here at the ACLJ, we are uniquely positioned to meet these evil attacks head on. We've assembled an elite legal team in our offices here in Jerusalem and around the globe, all thanks to you, our donors. In order to meet legal demands of historical proportions, today we are launching our Faith and Freedom Drive. Your gifts will be doubled, dollar for dollar. We need you now more than ever. The country needs you, the world needs you, and Israel needs you. Have your gift doubled through the ACLJ's Faith and Freedom Drive today. Go to ACLJ.org.
keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome back to Seculo. We are taking your phone calls to 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. We've talked a lot about what is going on in Israel. We've talked a lot about uh, these 14th Amendment cases. Let me update you again. If you just joined us while Ambassador Danone was on talking about Israel uh, in Michigan, uh, we have won. Uh, that has been uh, tossed by the judge there. Uh, we represented Michigan's uh, GOP plus six other GOPs, Oklahoma, Colorado, West Virginia, Kansas, North Dakota, and Delaware. And the judge there said this is not for the judiciary. This is a political question for Congress. Judges don't have a role in deciding who gets to be on the ballot. We're making closing arguments in Colorado today. The judge there has said uh, she expects the decision will be before Thanksgiving. Uh, that could uh, that, that could be That's by the Supreme Court case. Uh, yes. the end of this week. That could be uh, or early next week. I mean, that, that's again. I think we could be in the Supreme Court in that case in in December. And because it has to got be to get because military, of military ballots. ballots, and there's appeals there. This yep. is the initial court, so there's got to be an appellate phase there, and you've got to have time to get those military ballots printed early. The 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 people who request absentee ballots, you've got to get all of those printed. Yep. So you've got that going on. You've got, of course, the situation in Israel uh, going on as well. But uh, internationally, Rick Rennell's about to join us because right now as we speak, uh, you've got uh, uh, President Biden in California. Uh, with an, It's unusual, actually, to see uh, President Xi from China making moves all the way yeah. to the U.S., but they're 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 yes. holding meetings in San Francisco. Yep, that's going to be very interesting. We'll get some intake on that. Uh, we've got a question came in on, on YouTube I want to get to. Why did Hamas attack Israel? Hasn't there been peace there for years? What changed to cause us? There has not been peace there for years. There have been There's been less engagement. But this was a buildup, folks. They've been planning this attack for two years. Why? Because their charter, the Hamas charter, let me be clear on this. The Hamas charter calls for the destruction of the state of Israel. Can I be any clearer? It's in their charter in writing. It calls for the destruction of the state of Israel. That's it. So that's why that is. Let's go ahead and take a phone call. Joe's calling from New York. Joe, you're on the air. Thank you for taking my call and prayers for Israel and the hostages being held by Hamas. Thank you, sir. My question is, if the U.S. Supreme Court rules against what Colorado is doing to President Trump, does that set a precedent for the other states hoping to derail President Trump? Uh, it sure would. It would be binding on all 50 states. It would be the end of the lit- Quite frankly, Joe, it would be the end of the litigation. Yeah, this whole idea that this clause in the 14th Amendment would allow a secretary of state or a state actor to remove or not put someone or not count someone who's written in on a ballot because they think they've somehow violated a clause of the uh, amendment. And I think it will be similar to what the judge did in Michigan, which said, this is a political question for Congress to decide. It's like impeachment. Congress has all of these roles that are kind of similar to courts. And if they want to use them, they can. If, but if they decide not to, uh, courts aren't going to step in and be the arbiters of political questions for them and start deciding who and who, who will not be uh, put on ballots for Americans to choose to be either their nominee and ultimately to be their president of the United States. So that's why, uh, ultimately, unless... None of these cases, and I still think that would be surprising, but if none of these cases uh, were victorious for the other side to try and kick Trump off the ballot, that's the only way I see this not going uh, yeah, to the Supreme Court. This in Colorado. No, it just seems like in Colorado you've got uh, both a judge and a secretary of state saying, let's do this. Yeah. I mean, it's just it seems that way. Now, it's going to be a Supreme Court case. Again, hopefully that judge is looking at what's going on all across the country and seeing a variety of judges coming out with different opinions about yeah. why they believe. We've got a great team out there, by the way, with Jane Raskin leading it up as our special counsel, who I've worked with for years, and so is Jordan. Uh, she's on our team now. And um, she, so I'm, you know, I'm not losing hope in that case. I'm just trying to be realistic. Folks, we're taking a break. When we come back, we've got a lot more to discuss. We've got some major moves. Rick Rennell is going to be joining us on CC Highland, the last segment, because we've got major moves at the United Nations. A lot of information. We ever bring you this broadcast because of your support for the ACLJ. But we are in our ACLJ halfway through our Faith and Freedom Drive for the month of November. Any amount you donate is doubled. That makes a big difference. Just go to aclj.org slash faith and freedom. You saw the wins that we had on the 14th Amendment issue. Those are big wins for the election. You saw what we're doing. You see what we're doing for the hostages. We may have a global dimension to this as early as early December. A very probable uh, dimension to it. Support our work. If you can make it a monthly gift and become an ACLJ champion, aclj.org, your gift will be doubled. 
This is the time of year when we give thanks for all the blessings in our lives, our family, our health. But what about our more profound blessings that we as Americans are privileged to enjoy? Our faith, our freedom, unique liberties that so many people around the world can only dream about. Freedom to worship, freedom to speak. They're fragile freedoms that must be vigorously defended. And we've witnessed the attacks on faith and freedom on a global scale. It's time to take a bold step to join us in the fight, to join us in upholding the Constitution, and to defend the freedoms you hold most dear for your family, for our country, and for the world. Go to ACLJ.org to support our faith and freedom drive. This time of years, we're giving thanks, celebrating our liberties that we have in the United States. We also see those liberties are under attack. Freedom to speak, our freedom of religion. Victories that we have won over decades are being refought again in courts and in the halls of Congress, in international institutions. We're seeing, of course, the conflicts raging around the world, not just in Ukraine, but now in the Middle East and our ally, Israel, which is so important to so many of our ACLJ supporters. So our liberties here at home, you know they're under attack. Our friends, our allies around the world are under attack as well. That's why this faith and freedom drive is so important for you to donate. Dollar for dollar, you donate, we match. Dollar for dollar, each donation. This is an important time, the most important time, to support the work of the ACLJ. To Secchio, we are taking your phone calls to 1-800-684-3110. If you got questions about uh, the money uh, flowing to Iran, uh, if you got questions, too, about this meeting in California today by uh, the Chinese president and President uh, Joe Biden, we want to go to Rick Ornell, a senior advisor for foreign policy, also a political analyst for us here at the ACLJ. And, uh, Rick, first to this meeting in California, in San Francisco, which they cleaned the streets up for, uh, so I guess Chairman Xi didn't see all of the the people uh, who are addicted to drugs and living on the streets. They, I mean, you can see the before and after photos. Uh, but uh, what do you think the significance is of this meeting? We don't see President Xi travel much outside of the region and China, unless he's going to like a place like Russia or Russia's coming to him. Uh, but this move uh, to to have this meeting in California. Well, it makes sense. The Chinese consulate in San Francisco is where the Chinese do a lot of their messaging. It's uh, their headquarters, basically, for the United States. Uh, they're very successful in California, very successful in Northern California. You've seen some of the problems that we've had with politicians, California politicians in particular. Um, look, if you know the Chinese and how they negotiate uh, this deal is already done. Uh, there's no real time negotiation with the Chinese. All of this is done beforehand. Negotiations are completed. What you're just going to see now is more pomp and circumstance. Uh, it's going to be um, a, a situation where we'll release the agreement at uh, the end of the trip. But make no mistake, all of the pre stuff is where uh, we've been doing the hard negotiations. What I expect is that there's just gonna be a lot of talk on climate change. There won't be any mandates or specifics about enforcement. The Chinese will promise a lot. They won't be able to deliver and we won't hold them to it. Yeah. Uh, I'm anxious to see if we're gonna talk about Taiwan, electric vehicles or fentanyl. That'll be very interesting as well. Rick, we're getting a lot of calls coming in and this is in your area of expertise as well and that is dealing with Iran. The administration has released a hold, uh, removed a freeze, on $10 billion. We've got a call coming in. I want to take Donna's call, and let's give Donna and the rest of our audience an answer. This is a big deal. I think this is a huge mistake. But, Donna, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for all you do at ACLJ. Um, I was just wanting to hear your input into what the added risk to um, Israel because of the money being released of ten billion to Iran, and how the proxies uh, will likely all have a piece of it. So, if you could uh, sure. give your 
Well, look, on my view, and I'll get Rick's too, my view is money's fungible. So they could say it's being used for one thing, but then it frees up $10 million, billion, with a B, somewhere else. And that's the real problem here, is the utilization of this money and where it goes. And they, listen, all this regional fighting that you're seeing with the Houthis, with uh, Hezbollah, with Hamas, for that matter, is all funded by Iran, which now just got $10 billion of U.S. sanctioned money released. Yeah, Donna, let me tell you how bad it is. FBI Director Chris Wray testified this morning uh, in a real panic situation. He said, look, I want to tell all these legislators here that I said last year that our border was open to Iranian nationals and Iranian supported terrorists. He made a point this morning to say, look, it's not just Hamas that we're worried about. I said last year, this is a classic CYA. He is panicking because he knows that this open border has released so many people on the terrorist watch list into our country. The FBI director is trying to say, I told you last year, but here's what the FBI director hasn't been doing. He hasn't been telling us on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. His focus has not been on terrorists from Iran or Hamas. His focus has been on Catholics at school board meetings and white supremacy. This is a political FBI director, but this morning he was panicking to try to remind people that he did something last year. You know, Rick, I, I think uh, to, to move on from this to these kind of bigger topics as well, the, the billions of dollars uh, at a time when we know, and the U.S. government's been very clear about it, the Israeli government's been very clear about it, these proxies attacking Israel. And also, by the way, let's not forget, these proxies are attacking U.S. troops stationed in, in Syria and Iraq, and yet they have uh, unfrozen $10 billion worth of uh, resources so that Iraq can purchase Iranian uh, oil. Uh, and again, so we've already they got $6 billion, now another $10 billion. And, and again, we see what they do when they have these kind of resources. They use it to attack their enemies, and their enemies are our troops and Israel. And there's no question about it. The Biden administration for a very long time, from the very beginning of their tenure, they have trusted Iran. They've tried to bring Iran into the, the, the assembly of nations. They've wanted Iran to act more responsibly. They've given him money. They've trusted him. They've hired Iranian loyalists inside the U.S. government. Uh, we see this as a pattern. You can't be surprised when you give money to Iran that it's not going to come back in the form of terrorism. This is such a basic principle. I do not understand why the Biden team continues to trust them. But remember, too, the, the Houthis just uh, took down our drone, a $35 million taxpayer-funded drone. This is the same group that the Biden administration took off the terrorist watch list because they thought they weren't doing terrorism anymore. Now they're targeting us. You know, Rick, I know there's an issue that you've wanted to talk about. You don't think it's getting enough attention. And I'm not even sure a lot of our audience is getting a lot of attention just because of what else is happening in the world. But uh, the government in Spain is about to cave to the Catalan uh, region to potentially let them succeed, secede from Spain. Conservatives are for a unified Spain. There's tens of thousands protesting. Uh, but you th you think this huge story, and of course the ramifications it can have and repercussions it can have in Europe are huge, that there could be a break off, uh, I guess a new country, um, uh, independent in Europe? Look, uh, Spain has had a problem with uh, this, this, this region that's trying to be autonomous and trying to peel away for a while. It's Catalonia. What, what has happened recently is that uh, the socialist leader of Spain is doing so poorly in the polls that he has decided that he needs their vote in order to stay in office. And so what he has done is announced that he's going to forgive all of the crimes that these uh, individuals have created over the last years, serious crimes. He's going to suspend the rule of law, forgive them so that he gets their vote. My concern about this is that by giving in to them and wiping away their, their criminal activity, you are reviving the secessionists and their focus. Make no mistake, as soon as they get their records clean, they're going to come back and try to secede in Spain. President Trump saw this. 
He called it out. He said Spain should be united. And the problems largely quieted down when we had a very serious direct line from the president of the United States. The Biden team has been largely silent. And so this socialist leader in Spain is doing everything he can to keep in power by forgiving a whole bunch of people who committed crimes against the state, uh, terrorist activities. And now, as soon as they're wiped clean, they're going to come back and try to secede from Spain. Make no uh, mistake about it. You know, Rick, I'm, I'm thinking about the work that we're engaged in and that you're helping us with around the globe. And, I'm, I, I, you know, we started the day talking about that. We had the win in Michigan on the attempt to get Donald Trump off the ballot and the 14th Amendment issue. We've had a and we represented six state GOPs in that one. We've had a, a whole series of those cases. We won in Oklahoma. But now we know the one in Colorado where my colleague, our colleague Jane Raskin, is there today. Uh, finishing up that argument, the judge is going to issue a decision by Thanksgiving. Now, I'm not optimistic about that one. I think she may say they could pull them off, which means we're going to be fast-tracking that to the Supreme Court of the United States. While we've got negotiations going on for hostages in, uh, in, in Gaza right now, so we've got all of this work going on simultaneously, and there's multiple things you have to juggle at the same time, but all of these are important for the United States of America, every one of those. Every one of those are important. And I would also say, Jay, is there are not a lot of people focusing on some of these. We need to be able to have ACLJ team wide and and focused, uh, w- w- which means we need help. We need people to understand that when you participate with the ACLJ, when you spread the word, maybe if you yep. can't give money, maybe you just talk about our, our issues publicly and spread the word. We need the help because our team together can manage it and be on the front lines fighting for these issues. Thanks, Rick. Rick, as always, we appreciate all of your insight and, and some of these issues that aren't even being really touched on in the U.S., but nope. need to be because they make they have huge that, ramifications. Oh, giant forum for foreign policy use. Folks, this is the reason. Uh, look at the team, the ACLJ. We talked about uh, Rick Rennell, Jane Raskin, a well-known uh, lawyer, uh, Mike Pompeo, Tulsi Gabbard, I mean, on the list goes. And just because of your support of the ACLJ, we're in that matching challenge. The ACLJ Faith and Freedom Drive, now more than ever, is was our theme a couple of years ago. It's true still today. Go to aclj.org forward slash faith and freedom. And if you can make it a monthly gift, folks, I just did the math. We could see our revenue increase significantly. I mean, we can empower a whole new group of lawyers and, and government affairs people just by the cha- ACLJ champions. You'd play that big of a role if you can make that a monthly gift aclj.org back with the last segment in just a moment and we start with breaking news tonight out of gaza the israeli military says it's carrying out quote targeted operations at al shifa hospital that's the largest hospital in the strip for nearly two weeks israel's military has made its case to the world for targeting al shifa now they are inside says colonel richard hecht israel's military spokesman when we entered the hospital, there was a small engagement with, uh, with gunmen, with Hamas gunmen. What happened there? There was an engagement of fire. Uh, we exchanged fires, and that's all I can see at this point. The White House says it doesn't support a firefight. There was no patients harmed. We, we only responded to an engagement when we entered. It was the outside of the hospital. Israel claims a Hamas command center lies beneath, which newly declassified U.S. intelligence supports, claims Hamas denies. We had intelligence on to take care of potential Hamas infrastructure inside the hospital. We're not uh, capturing the hospital or overtaking the hospital. Israel has released new video from an underground look at a pediatric hospital specializing in cancer treatment. So the terrorists have gone underground beneath this very large hospital to protect themselves. We can see this area is a closed area from the rest of the hospital. We can see the ventilation air that was done improvisedly to this area. And we can see infrastructures that was built in here. Toilets, shower, a small kitchen will provide the terrorists their needs. Also conduct a hideout, a hideout where terrorists take hostages and hideout. No, Hamas is is hiding in, in, in hospitals, they're hiding in playgrounds, they're hiding in mosques, they're hiding in many of these these buildings which are supposed to be safe for civilians, um, but they're not.
All right, welcome back to Secchio. A lot to talk about. Of course, we'll take your calls, too, if you call it down, 1-800-684-3110 and to cover uh, during these weeks all over uh, the country as well. Uh, but there is, of course, action that we are taking, too, at the United Nations you know, on behalf of these hostages. Unfortunately, we've heard report, multiple reports were floating around yesterday about whether or not there'd be a multi-day ceasefire to get these hostages removed. And that kind of haven't heard much about that the, ne- the next day. There were um, some hopes that some of these hostages would be found in these underground tunnels underneath hospitals so far. Remnants of hostages being there have been found, yes. but uh, hostages themselves have not been found. In fact, yesterday we heard, unfortunately, that a uh, a hostage who was 19 and in the IDF uh, was killed uh, uh, by, uh, it appears to be Hamas. They're trying to blame it on Israel, but uh, no one is buying we, that. We also know that a hostage, a hostage in custody, a woman that was in custody, who was pregnant, gave birth to her child uh, yesterday in Gaza. We don't know the nature, the, the status of the mother or the child, but I mean, you can, the, the horror of this you cannot even imagine. I will say this, the European Union and our team at the European Center for Law and Justice has been working on this, condemned all of the member states, condemned Hamas's utilization of hospitals as launching sites. Those are big announcements folks because they were always reluctant before and now the evidence is pointing to it so that's a that's a positive positive statement now there's going to be a we just did the big round of of u.s hostages in the united states we're now moving that operation uh to uh to europe and we'll be heading over there but before we do that we need to tell you what's going on at the u.n now we've got four filings that we've done so far and we, we, there's going to be many more. In fact, our lawyers in Israel are meeting with uh, 30 or 40 hostage families Sunday to get them signed up. And you'll be doing those filings in the next week. CC is a little probability. Yes, so we've filed, we've submitted communications to the working group on enforced or involuntary disappearances. And so that is a working group under the United Nations that actually has to investigate and requires the forces that have abducted people. Um, to provide information to them, which then they kind of act as the liaison between the family members and these groups. Of course, do we expect no. Hamas to abide by any rules or law? No, we do not. I mean, we see that they, you know, violate the law of armed conflict by using hospitals as a military base. So, you know, we're not very uh, hopeful that Hamas will do no, the right thing. But, the United absolutely. Nation, but it does put the United Nations in a vice. When they want to do their pro-Hamas thing, you remind them, hey, we filed 100, hopefully 120, uh, applications to your committee, and Hamas won't even respond to you. So that's what they think of you, United Nations. By the way, it's not just Israel saying these hospitals are utilized. The Biden administration is saying that as well. This is what John Kirby said. Take a listen. I can confirm for you that we have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad use some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including Al-Shifa, and tunnels underneath them to conceal and to support their military operations and to hold hostages. They have stored weapons there, and they're prepared to respond to an Israeli military operation against that facility. And that is a direct violation of the Geneva Convention. It's a direct violation of the international law of armed conflict. They're not allowed to do this. Everybody knows they're doing it now. There is no secret. Yeah, I mean, th- that's the thing. You've got now the U.S. backing up Israel 100% and saying it's clear that they are using uh, uh, these tunnels underneath hospitals. And that is uh, about as gross of a violation of human rights uh, violations and the law of war as you can get. Uh, and But again, I think that this is the issue, is that these uh, crazed supporters of the uh, Palestinian uh, resistance or whatever they want to call it, liberation, they just ignore all this and say, oh, this is propaganda from the West. They now uh, don't trust Joe Biden. He's he's no good anymore. So John Kirby gets up there. He says it. Oh, that can't be true. They're making it up. They literally show you video of it. Oh, that's got to be fake. That can't be real. And even the media, I have to say, to some extent, mainstream media in America says, you know, it's so-called. Like, they, they will not accept any of this as fact. They, they, they still want to hold out hope, what, that Hamas isn't actually... Uh, doing this, I mean, how many more State Department officials are going to sign on to another dissent cable after Kirby said that? Well, that's the, that, that's exactly right. And there you got fifteen hundred. But, but so, it, I mean, it is they... putting the international community, CC, in in real notice here. And yeah. we are we're we've got an operation we're working on right now in Europe that will include Brussels, probably Paris, and Strasbourg, and over about a ten day period. 
uh, to move on the hostage, assuming the hostages aren't released by then. My prayer is that those trips mm-hmm. get canceled and the hostages are released. But if that doesn't happen, we're already preparing. We were on a conference call this morning, a Zoom call with lawyers all over the country, all over the world, uh, putting this together because that's the next phase of this. Right. International pressure needs to be be hot and remain on Hamas. And we have seen, like you just said, the EU has come out and condemned Hamas for using a hospital as a military base, which is illegal. And we need those kind of condemnations internationally, publicly to remain. Hamas cannot continue to use the media to spin their cause, which they always do. We need direct international condemnation of Hamas's action and force them to release those hostages. You know, the other aspect, and that includes the military actions, will help on that forcing, too. So the fact that they've engaged in Gaza like this. But there's another element of this. The, the veneer of Hamas, even though these students are marching around like lunatics, and that's what they are because they have no idea what they're marching for. Clueless. Totally clueless. Hamas rapes and murders women. They behead children. I mean, it's horrible. I'm not even going to go through it. I, I, I can't. And, and you, these students that are marching should be ashamed of themselves. And, and the parents of these students paying for their education should be ashamed of themselves. And these foundations that are donating money to these universities that will not speak out should be embarrassed and be called out, which is starting to happen, by the way. Okay, law firms are saying, I'm not hiring law students from Harvard and Yale. I'm not hiring law students from Columbia. Forget it. Go get a job someplace else. And then the smaller firms are going to do exactly the same thing and say, forget it. All of that to say, this is the the pressure that has to go on in the next several weeks. This is These are short window of opportunities. Is going to be dramatic for the ACLJ, the ECLJ, and all of our affiliates. And we've got to coordinate a very, very aggressive schedule to get the kind of results that we need here. Yeah, that's right. Because if you don't and you let this kind of fester, we know which side carries the day. And it's always uh, the bad guys. Because people forget about the the bad things they did. They show you, look, our, our cities were destroyed, and they were. Most of their towns have been destroyed. Uh, their streets have been destroyed. I mean, and Gaza's been pretty much decimated for the most part. And they're going to say, you know, we need hundreds of millions of dollars from the U.N. to rebuild. And they'll take those hundreds of million dollars, they'll rebuild, and guess who they'll put back in power? Hamas. So after they rebuild, they'll put in a terrorist group in power, and that terrorist group will then start factories to create weapons, and we'll be in back in another, I don't know if you called that, what, like a 10-year cycle? Yeah. Where they basically More rearm and reset up, and they... Every time they do that, they take their level of weaponry up a level. And now that they've got Iran, which got, which has got money to spend now, like $16 billion, exactly. they, they can rebuild their weapons a lot quicker. And, you, and we haven't even seen Hezbollah fully engaged this not yet. yet. And if then Hezbollah the, did, we're talking about a very different conflict. And then you have the whole deep state inside the Biden administration going after Biden because he's supporting Israel. This is what's going on. Well, this is the problem if you're Republican or Democrat. If you, if, if you take a position different than them... They will put every bureaucratic piece of red tape in front of your ideas and your decisions that you have the right to make to slow them down so that they may not even get made by the time you leave office. All right, folks, we need your support. The halfway point for our November Faith and Freedom Drive. Go to aclj.org forward slash faith and freedom. Your support makes a huge difference. You know we had that win at the 14th Amendment case involving the tr- Trump being on the ballot. You know that we're working hard on these hostage situations. If you can make that gift a monthly gift, you become an ACLJ champion. It takes it up to a whole nother level. We encourage you to do that if you're able. But if not, just go to aclj.org and support our work with our Faith and Freedom Drive. We'll talk to you tomorrow.